this we have the OSHA mandate first and this was actually uh, reinstated uh, let's see December 17th I believe was the ruling from the Sid Circuit Court of Appeals and the write-up here is by Reuters basically explaining that this is the mandate that Biden uh, declared I believe in September saying that any business with at least 100 employees would have to have a mandatory vaccine program or a mandatory uh, test and mask for anybody who is unvaccinated. And I believe the test would be weekly. Uh, I'm sure it would really add up uh, in cost. Now, initially, a lower court ruled uh, uh, or put an injunction on OSHA enforcing Biden's mandate, saying that it, you know, it would likely go to the Supreme Court and be found unconstitutional and that I guess there would you know, be damages done in the time. Uh, between then and when the Supreme Court ruled. And so, uh, you know, initially it is shut down by an injunction. And then the Sixth Circuit Court, I believe on a two to one ruling uh, where it is uh, justices appointed by Democrats uh, that go ahead and re or reject the injunction. Now, I do expect this, you know, to go to the Supreme Court. And I don't think that this... Um, ruling necessarily reflects a, a ruling of uh, constitutionality or not. Uh, it merely, I, I think, was just an argument in lifting the injunction. So I'm not exactly sure on where this goes to court from here. Um, my hope is that it does get get to court at the Supreme Court before I believe Biden has announced the new start date. It was initially supposed to be January 4th. Now it's going to be January 10th. And so it seems almost problematic that they backed it up just a week after this thing was, um, you know, slow down by an injunction, I think for almost a month. And and so, you know, you think you would have given companies a little bit more time, but uh, again, hopefully it gets to another court by January 10th. And, you know, then it could be argued on. Now, I guess maybe I, I'm sure there's not many people within my audience that is actually pro uh, vaccine mandate, but assuming that you know some people are maybe somewhat comfortable with it in some cases, um, I I just I, I don't think this the the way to do it would be by through executive action as Biden has, and that's you know one of the real problems here. Now, uh, I really have enjoyed reading some of Mike Meharry's takes on this over at the Tenth Amendment Center, who has really pointed out and argued that look. OSHA doesn't have the workforce to make this happen. Uh, there are so many businesses. This is going to apply to 80 million people. And so it's going to rely on a lot of essentially voluntary compliance. Now, there is some force to it because you could get busted. You could get fined. You know, OSHA could come to your business, but it's unlikely to happen. And so... Uh, you know, there, there's going to be a real, I, I guess, ability to fight this thing on an administrative level, probably. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, uh, there's a lot to be decided here, but I have been talking about this case on the show in the past. And I do think it's very important that right now uh, it, it seems like they're trying to push this forward. And for about 84 million Americans, that's going to mean either having a mask on 24 seven or not 24 seven, anytime you're at work, I guess, eight hours a day at work, uh, likely for most people. Although I wonder if there's any, you know, exceptions. Uh, I talked to a lot of people who are doubles, like 16 hour shifts, especially right now as uh, the, uh, there, there's like a shortage of workers. A lot of places are hiring, struggling to hire. And so there's a lot of people working double shifts and stuff like that. Uh, having one of these masks on for 16 hours at a time uh, could be a lot. Also just issues, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, with you know using all this these COVID tests because right now there's a, a shortage of those. And so if we're going to be burning through COVID tests on obviously healthy people, what kind of other consequences will that have? have on, you know, where, where these COVID tests could go, particularly, you know, talking about, you know, maybe for healthcare workers in like lower income countries or something like that, where, um, you know, there, there's a real shortage of COVID tests in a lot of places in the world still. All right.
The court, uh, this I believe was a Fifth Circuit court, uh, actually reinstated the healthcare worker vaccine mandate that was executively uh, announced by Joe Biden in 26 states. And so I'm not quite sure where all the rulings on this are, but there are two rulings in the past on the show that we covered uh, by a New Orleans federal court that blocked the mandate in 14 states and by a St. Louis federal court uh, that blocked the mandate in 10 states. And so those in those 24 states, this mandate still will not be in place. But for the other 26 states, it will be. And I recommend and, you know, if you're concerned about this or something, uh, go in and try to find out exactly where your state is on this, uh, because I'm guessing it's going to be changing. Uh, there seems to be three different kind of legal standings and cases going on. And, you know, just make sure you have a very good understanding of what's happening in your case and what court it could potentially go to. So so, you know, it could go on now. Maybe, you know, one of the, the few places that I could see people actually feeling comfortable with a COVID vaccine uh, mandate or something like that would be in certain healthcare facilities, right? Like if you want all the staff at a retirement home to have it, that doesn't seem completely ir irrational to me. And I could see that, you know, there being a market, even, it, even if it ends up that it's not, you know, data verifiably scientifically able to show that having an entire staff of, uh, of retirement home vaccinated reduces the likeliness of people in that retirement community to die from COVID. I could really see, you know, people who have the choice of where their, their loved ones, you know, what, where they house them, uh, as they get older, that they would look for facilities that are, uh, you know, that they guarantee 100% vaccination rate. Now, I also know people who don't care at all about that. And even if data showed that, you know, scientifically provable data that if you have 100% the um, staff of a you know, uh, facility vaccinated is going to make uh, outbreak that much less likely. And, you know, you're your loved ones 10% say for that, you know, they, they don't care or, you know, they do care, but it's not the top priority for them. You know, they see, uh, like, you know, Alzheimer's dementia or whatever else ailment that the, you know, person has going on. There's a lot of ailments older people could have, and, and they're more concerned about having higher quality of care there. And so they don't care if the staff is vaccinated. You know, th there's a lot of reasons that, that people would want, you know, different kinds of scenarios and settings. And, and so I'm not saying that I think it's terrible if any healthcare facility has a vaccine mandate, but at the same time, I don't think that there should be a nationwide mandate, mainly because, you know, one of the great things that the market can do is it could say, OK, well, you know, all these people are comfortable. They don't care if their doctors are vaccinated or not. Like, you know, what I mean, like, I hope my doctor doesn't go to work sick. Right. Like, I hope he has that level of awareness being a doctor that he's not going to work sick. And I really don't care if he's vaccinated or not. And that this seems like perfect, perfectly reasonable position, one that I would have. I'm not concerned if my doctor's vaccinated, right? But some people are. And so if, if they want to go to a vaccinated doctor and have that market, great. But I don't want a shortage of doctors. And so I would rather facilities exist where unvaccinated medical staff could work. That way, too, even people who don't want to go to, you know, somebody who's unvaccinated, if it really comes down to it and you're really sick and you need to go to a hospital, I'm sure everybody would choose to go to a hospital with unvaccinated staff versus dying in their home of, you know, something other than COVID, right? Or even of COVID. But, anyways. It's just, you know, I think the market could solve for this and the overall, you know, country d decision that you either can or have to have this or, you know, can't even uh, provide some more problems. On the last show, I have mentioned that Amtrak was, uh, or the last show that I covered COVID, that is, I have mentioned that Amtrak had suspended vaccine mandate or had uh, vaccine mandates for its employees and was going to suspend services, uh, particularly, I think, even on the East Coast and cut down services. And so uh, Amtrak has now announced that they are going to suspend the vaccine mandate uh, to, to make up for this. And I think it does go to show, as I've seen a lot of people say that if you resist these mandates, the, the employers will eventually be the ones that have to give in. 
We have uh, California to require booster shots for healthcare workers. And it's one of the first times that I'm seeing like a government uh, mandate booster shots in the United States. You know, this is kind of interesting because initially a lot of the debate around the COVID, uh, you know, mandates had to do with uh, the, the fact that the FDA had only given it emergency approval and not full approval, and it was kind of after the, the FDA gave Pfizer full approval that the government started feeling comfortable to roll out these uh, mandates. I believe now that it's only Pfizer, and they have only just now uh, um pushed uh you know the the booster or they're, they're trying to seek it now through the fda the the full approval for the mandate and so you know i think is there's just a huge bait and switch on this issue which once the fda gave uh pfizer initial approval on the vaccine even though that was only for two doses it just opened the floodgates and the, it became the emergency authorization no longer became an issue for any of these uh, government bureaucracies now i think that's propaganda i think it's you know all a bunch of crap but at the same time i i I feel like I very predictably saw that happening as just a way to move from this emergency authorization issue. And now, you know, people are having to take something that isn't approved by the FDA. This is uh, an interesting article here at Business Insider, and it uh, has to do with a subject that I've been talking a lot about on the show, and that is there's uh, reports of, I think, like 11 to 14 to maybe 22 million at most uh, people in the United States who have only taken one dose of the vaccination. Now, another thing that I've talked about a lot, not necessarily a ton on the show, but with, you know, friends, family and other young know, libertarians and stuff like that is just, you know, how much does the CDC or the federal government in general know who's vaccinated? And my guess is that they really don't know and they're guessing a lot. And that's why, you know, they've revised the number of uh, people over 65 who have been partially vaccinated from 99 percent down to 95 percent. Um but now uh, this article is pointing out that, you know, there's this uh, massive gap between the, the number of people who have uh, received one dose, according to the CDC, and the, the number of people that are fully vaccinated. Now, you do expect some gap between the two uh, based on that. There's a two week window right between when you get your first and your second vaccination. And so that would made sense. And at this time, at least they are counting fully vaccinated as anybody with two shots of, even if you got it like in the trial, I believe you're not at this point, they're not saying that, well, you, it's been a full year since you got your second dose. So now if you don't have that, we're going to consider you unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. They're still considering that crew, uh, that group of people to be fully vaccinated. And so what this is saying is that actually they're misidentifying a lot of what happened here. Uh, they, they're giving people, or uh, they're counting people second doses are booster shots as first shots. And I, I suppose, you know, this could even be because, you know, maybe people feeling a little bit paranoid, uh, lied, said they weren't vaccinated and like took another, uh, you know, as like a booster shot or something like that. Uh, but my, my guess is that this is just government bureaucracy failures. And, you know, they're, they're just generally guessing like, the, you know, counties give numbers and they're generally correct on how many people got vaccinations that day, how many were, you know, Johnson and Johnson versus mRNA, how many were first shots, second shots, boosters and everything. And that data makes it up to the CDC. And I'm sure like most of the time it gets there correctly, like nobody types in extra zero or, you know, misses a nine for a six or something like that. But, you know, I'm sure those things do happen. And over time, it's just essentially junk the data and, you know, to say the U.S. has this level of people fully vaccinated, I think, is a, a very general number. Now, I want to talk about something else. Uh, the media in the Biden administration is moving away from the term fully vaccinated and now using the term fully immunized. And I think there's like uh, several levels to this piece of propaganda, but it's just something I want to bring uh, everybody's attention to because I, I think it's going to uh, really be out there. In, in, in full swing in the next couple of weeks that 
that's the way uh, that you talk about somebody who's quote unquote fully vaccinated is that they're fully immunized. Now, the, this doesn't seem to maybe be true because if you have full immunity to something, then you couldn't get it. But if you, you know, even the CDC admits that there's plenty of vaccine or uh, breakthrough cases of people who are fully vaccinated. And I think this is a way to distort and try to, um, uh, obscure the issue on people who are saying that, you know, uh, I had COVID, so now I have immunity, I have full immunity, uh, and and take and basically trying to co-opt the word immunity uh, and make that what you get from the vaccine when that's really not the case. You know, immunity is like, I'm not going to get it. And you can't get it after you had the vaccine. Now, you know, they're, they're going to say, and everybody, you know, has to say after you say, you can get COVID even if you had the vaccine. Um, but they say it's going to make you get a less severe case if you get it right. Like, you know, we all have to repeat that anyways. Um, uh, but at that, you know, it's worth noting that they're, they're, I think using an incorrect term there, but I think that's going to be the new, uh, propaganda that we're going to see in the, the coming weeks. Uh, Biden will lift, uh, the curb, the travel ban, on eight African countries this uh, coming week. I think it's going to take place on January 1st. Uh, the countries are South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, uh, Nambia, Lesothis, Aswani, uh, Mozambique, and Malawi. And these were essentially people were banned from them from the start of Omicron on, even though it really hasn't made sense as to why the Biden administration has only kept the ban on these countries when, you know, the, there was large outbreaks, almost larger than many of these African countries and European countries, uh, Israel, and I'm sure other countries around the world, but those are the two I could think of that have very early on COVID uh, Omicron uh, variant outbreaks and that at the same time, uh, didn't receive travel bans from the United States. Now, the other issue here and the bigger one is the new variant, uh, this Omicron variant is, you you know, the, the first uh, at least generally agreed to major outbreak of it was in uh, South Africa. And I was just looking today at the data from South Africa. And while there's been a major spike in positive, you know, test results and uh, reports of cases from South Africa, essentially throughout the entire month of December. Now we're almost four weeks, or I think we are four weeks into this outbreak in South Korea, or not South Korea, South Africa, excuse me. And if you look at the data and you compare the, the number of cases to, you know, the, there's, you know, always people uh, dying in countries that, you know, have tested positive of, of COVID. And so, you know, prior to the outbreak, it was a, a few people a day, a couple dozen, maybe up to 30. Uh, now that we're in the outbreak, uh, it's, you know, 50, 70 people a day. But if you compare uh, to the previous three uh, outbreaks and spikes in cases in South Africa, it's multiple times lower, like four or five times lower, where in the, the other uh, spikes, it was hundreds of people dying a day. They haven't hit 100 people a day in South Africa during this lace. I think they call it the fourth wave now. They're, they're calling it waves, not spikes or whatever, uh, of the Omicron uh, variant that they're having in South Africa. And I think that's one probably should be one of the most important things to talk about right now you know they're, they're saying we need lockdowns and masks and everybody needs to be vaccinated booster 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 but nobody's looking and what's happening in south africa and saying okay if this is going to bring the you know number of deaths down by a factor of you know you know two two three four something like that do we actually should we look at you know maybe less mitigation me measures because this appears to be, and again, this is just, you know, me looking at data from South Africa, comparing uh, this wave to previous waves and, you know, the, the cases to the deaths and, and kind of not seeing a spike in deaths despite seeing a spike in cases, it, you know, maybe it's less important to have a major, um, a major lockdown or something like that. Now, the last thing I got to mention on this, kill me if I didn't do it. If it was Donald Trump that instituted this travel ban on eight African countries, seemingly 
uh, maybe in reaction to fear initially, but and then kept it on for no reason. Uh, you know, once it once it was in place, it was very clear that this variant was in numerous other countries that the U.S. did not ban travel from. And in fact, you know, the U.S. officials have been flying around Europe for uh, the past month, having all kinds of meetings, and there was no concern about that. Um, you know, Andy Blinken even had uh, his members of his flight crew as he's traveling around Southeast Asia, and, you know, c- c- uh, contract COVID. You know, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. But anyways, you know, banning arbitrarily, seemingly, you know, uh, especially once this uh, variant is in other countries, people from these African African country. If this was Trump, it would be decried as racist and they would have been protesting about it. Uh, but it's under Biden. Nobody even like mentions that like, hey, it seems kind of odd that you're not banning uh, the people from the white countries uh, where there's an Omicron outbreak, but you're banning people from the black countries where that's happening. The CDC says most Americans should take uh, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine over Johnson and Johnson safety concerns. One of the very interesting things about this is back, you you know, in I guess what it was March or April or something. Uh, pretty soon after people started taking uh, the the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. There was a report of SIDS people, and I think this is in April that all this comes out. Uh, SIDS people die of blood clots related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and now that total is nine. And through that whole time, they're saying, ah, don't worry about it. It's just a couple people. We gave millions of doses of these vaccines and everything like that. And now they're saying that this is significant enough that they're you know recommending other vaccines against it. And it just seems like there's a major leap in logic it there because uh it seems like less people have been dying of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, you know, over the, the past nine months compared to the first, what, like three months it was out uh, because only according to them, three people have died since then. And, it's just uh, it's very confusing how the CDC is coming to the conclusion and making the recommendations that they're making. Uh, you know, before everything's OK with Johnson and Johnson and now they're you know warning to take uh, the, the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccines. Now, to me, I guess in my uh, brain, I, I my my immediate guess is corruption, right? That this has something to do with these two companies maybe having more sway and influence at the CDC, and they're going to be able to cash in big if they're able to weed out the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Now, the other issue here is too uh, something to note is that it is the two mRNA vaccines that they're pushing, and there is the Johnson and Johnson, but also the Novavats. That has not yet been approved, despite showing some, uh, I think, like a 90% effective rate uh, against getting COVID and then 100% effective rate uh, against severe illness and everything like that hasn't been approved in the U.S. And uh, there are a lot of people who you still talk to who are uncomfortable with the you know way these vaccines were rushed out and the new mRNA technology. And it seems that the, the CDC and the FDA are kind of working against having alternatives on the market uh, or, you know, promoting them or making them, you know, feel safe to people uh, in favor of promoting the mRNA vaccines that tend to make people more uncomfortable. Biden's planning to buy 500 million tests to tackle the COVID surge. This seems uh, pointless because the Biden administration uh, doesn't even have contracts for these tests yet. There's always test shortages. And so I'm I mean, at best, they're just going to like, you know, zap the market of all the tests and maybe they'll be able to provide some free ones, but it'll be from the government. And so, you know, it'll likely be less efficient than people just going to the local Walgreens or CVS and getting their test kits there themselves, even if it does cost a little bit more money, uh, it, you know, initially out of pocket for the people who had to buy the test. Of course, the government will probably spend more money on the test than individuals would. But the other problem with this is one of the general problems I have with how the Biden administration has has handled COVID. It's all reactionary, right? And so not not that you know everything is predictable, but if you look at what's happened with the US and COVID, you know, it comes in main places in waves, right? Like you have uh an, an uptake in cases over two, three, four weeks, and then it starts to decline. 
And if you're just, you know, if you're seeing a COVID surge, right, happening in the United States, and your solution is to buy 500 test kits in the coming months, you're going to be late on it. Those test kits aren't going to be for this surge. You know, that's another thing with like all these states uh, that, you know, they deploy. We have, I think, Ohio. Uh, well, Biden is deploying a thousand, a thousand soldiers and nurses. Uh, Ohio is deploying a thousand National Guardsmen. And Massachusetts is deploying 500 National Guardsmen, which, you know, we get into reasons why the hospitals need the, the military personnel when, you know, they, they could just have their other staff in the, the first place. But, you know, the, these people need training. Massachusetts is just now training this week. Well, they're already in the middle of the COVID outbreak. It's already going to be on the decline. The same thing with these tests or how the Biden administration delivers vaccines to countries that have like, you know, a peak number of cases. Well, bringing them vaccines then isn't helpful. It, it, you should be you know, trying to predict, you know, what maybe country is going to have an outbreak. Assuming you believe everything, right? Like I know some people in my audience will roll their eyes at it, but but assuming that, you know, you're the Biden administration and your goal really is to stop worldwide COVID and all of that, you know, if, if you're delivering bad scenes to a country that's like at a peak or on decline, the outbreak it's really pointless, right? Because by the time they figure out and get the, the bad scenes to the medical facilities, then, you know, it's already on the decline. A lot of people in the country are, a, you know, group of people in the country now have natural immunity. And also the vaccines are only fa effective or you know, their, their effectiveness, according to even the CDC and dead, that's why they're telling people to get boosters and everything like that. Um, the, the effectiveness declines over time. And so what you should be trying to do is I think predict what country is going to have an outbreak, maybe where that outbreak will happen. And then, you know, focus on giving vaccines or boosters, it, you know, in those places, not, you know, just picking out which country is making headlines for having a COVID outbreak and then sending a million vaccines there. That's, that's not an effective way. And that's, kind of the way the Biden administration has handled this uh, COVID throughout. And not that many of these mitigation strategies have worked, but, you know, coming up with mitigation strategies after the, the outbreak or after the wave is already happening isn't isn't effective. It's just is not going to work even by, you know, the, their own ideas of what works and doesn't. Another thing going on in Massachusetts, as they have deployed, or not deployed, they have deployed the, the National Guard, although I think they've just started training uh, this past week. Uh, but they're banning uh, elective procedures uh, starting this week in in hospitals, and this is this is pretty disappointing. You know, something that's an elective procedure, you know, may only be elective for a certain amount of time, and if it becomes not elective, it could become very dangerous. And you know, that that's something to consider with this. Uh, you know, if we're canceling doctor's appointments, you know, this includes cancer screenings. On it, it's absolutely terrible you know uh, massachusetts is a state with a high vaccination rate uh they've, they've had a lot of covid restrictions and everything there and so you know one, one of the things that's been brought up in some of these articles i've read is that the staffing shortage in these uh, medical facilities has been going on for some time and it's more from the the vaccine mandate requirements and so i guess you have to wonder if the the healthcare system would be handling this better if it was you, you didn't have the vaccine mandates and you have more healthcare workers that had remained in their jobs. And then, um, not saying that, you know, it is going to equal out or that you're going to kill more people uh, by having staffing shortages in hospitals, but having staffing shortages in hospitals can kill people or in, you know, old folks in retirement homes, right? Like if you don't have enough staff there, then things go unnoticed. You know, maybe you don't realize somebody didn't take their medication. Uh, mistakes happen. People get the wrong medication. Uh, people don't get cleaned up best enough and develop infections. Uh, people don't eat enough. You know, the, these kind of things happen if you if you have staffing shortages in, in healthcare facilities. And so it's not exactly like if there's you know, no downside to putting in these vaccine mandates and then having uh, the, the shortages of, of staff. 
All right, let's talk about the military real quick. Uh, the Navy is in the process right now of starting to kick out sailors who do not take uh, the COVID vaccination. Uh, the Air Force has discharged the first 27 soldiers uh, for refusing to get the vaccine. The Air Force pointed out that these were all people on their first enlistment and who had not applied for an exemption. And so I don't know, maybe they were looking for a way out of the military or something. Um, but at the same time, you know, it could be a, a career ending decision that the Air Force made for a lot of these uh, these young men and could be you know pretty traumatic and upsetting for their lives. Uh, as far as I've seen, the Pentagon, at least at this point, doesn't seem to be, you know, seeking um, any kind of financial money back from these soldiers, but they have talked about not giving them access to the, the GI Bill things that they would have gotten otherwise. The USS Milwaukee, a ship of what I've seen referred to as fully immunized, uh, but what I think they mean is fully vaccinated uh, sailors, has a major COVID outbreak and is going to remain in Guantanamo Bay and not sail Again, you know, they're now offering booster shots for the people on this ship, but, you know, the people on this ship are going to be, uh, you know, have natural immunity now. And so it's very curious as to why they're focusing on giving boosters to people on these ships and not, you know, focusing on ships that don't have an active outbreak. So far, 12,000 people within the Pentagon have applied for a uh, religious exemption uh, to taking the COVID-19 vaccination, and the Pentagon has granted zero of them. I, I'm guessing that this is going to be their policy, that they're not going to give uh, any um Exemptions to anybody who took the the COVID or who aimed, who's you know requesting a, a way out of taking the COVID vaccine, uh, but it's you know kind of disturbing I guess that they're not awarding any. Although uh, you, you know the military is one of the the few places where I guess you you do kind of expect that you're going to have less of a uh, amount of control over what the you know they're going to inject into your body. Uh, you talk about, uh, you know, talk to a lot of soldiers, even before COVID, they, they would talk about, you know, you're a pin cushion when you, you get into the army and they just jab you with a whole bunch of things and you don't know what half of them are. So let's see. Then there are infections in Japan and outbreak linked to a U.S. base. And, you know, this is something that I've talked about a lot on the show. And I, I've been kind of frustrated with where you have the U.S. government that works really hard to lock down Americans and will ban travel from certain countries and all that. But then uh, U.S. officials and diplomats are parading around the world doing all kinds of unnecessary things and photo ops and, you know, Anthony Blinken's traveling to Southeast Asia and, you know, Kamala Harris already did a tour there, and so did Lloyd Austin. Uh, Biden was recently in Europe, and uh, you know, having different summits. Uh, they they had a big climate change summit and everything. Uh, so. You know, if you're worried about the spread of COVID worldwide and all that kind of stuff, it seems really stupid to be sending U.S. soldiers all over the world and not to, you know, have things on relative lockdown. And you know, you're going to have spread from things like the USS Milwaukee and uh, the the spread from uh, the U.S. Uh, a worker at uh, Camp Hassan, uh, which I think is in Okinawa, Japan. All right, the Pentagon uh, stopped implementing the vaccine mandate for defense contractors. This came uh, after a court ruling uh, that actually stopped the contractor mandate, the federal government contractor mandate. Uh, but, it's, you know, I guess kind of interesting. Uh, what I thought was going to happen was that this mandate wasn't going to go ahead for defense contractors. Uh, they're going they're, they have enough lobbying power to prevent it. So uh, th that seems to be what's going on here. Um all right, so a few stories on vaccines uh, and kind of vaccine programs worldwide. Uh, this one from Reuters, refugees lack COVID shots because drug makers fear lawsuits. And, you know, I'm not sure it, it is Reuters talking about COVID and that they really do toe the establishment line. Uh, but the, the main argument is that there's a fear apparently from like Pfizer and vaccine makers that if they start distributing the COVID vaccines in, say, a refugee camp where... 
you know, let, let's talk about the Al Hall uh, refugee camp in Syria, where you know this is ISIS fighters. There's not good sanitation there. Um, absolutely horrible conditions. Not enough food. I've talked about the rampant sexual abuse and everything going on in in these camps in the past. Uh, malnutrition, and so if you're vaccinating this population, uh, the, there's probably going to be an increase, not necessarily in side effects from the vaccine, but just an increase in health episodes that are happening in or around the time people are taking the vaccine. Cause there's uh, an abnormally large number of like rare, um, health incidents that happen in, you know, camps where you have, poor water, poor sanitation, uh, you know, massive uh, sexual abuse and stuff like that going on. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's some justified uh, concern there, but it, it just seems like a really hollow excuse, I think, uh, as why more uh, refugee camps are gaining access to these vaccines. The U.S. is donating vaccines around the world. Uh, I've had trouble really keeping track of and focusing that they haven't in the past been too uh, public of where all these vaccines are going. But recently I've found the state department Twitter account really lights to show off how many uh, vaccines were given out. And so uh, it's 1.5 million Pfizer vaccines that we just donated to Egypt through the COVID program. And this is uh, what they say a part of 15 million doses that were uh, donated in the past four months. I believe all those 15 million doses, did go to Egypt. You know, Egypt is a country that's relatively wealthy and, you know, important player, I, you know, compared to a lot of the neighboring countries and stuff like that. And uh, the U.S. gives Egypt billions of dollars a year in military aid. They have a very, again, relatively uh, strong and powerful military. And so, have to wonder why Egypt is gained so much priority other than just being an important puppet in the, the U.S. world empire. Libya received over a million uh, Pfizer vaccines through the COVAX program uh, from the United States as well. The U.S. brought 200,000 to Jamaica. I don't think this was through the COVAX program. And they say that it's, the U.S. has donated over 600,000 doses uh, to Jamaica overall. The U.S. Uh, announced a group of 4.9 million uh, COVID doses going to 11 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's over 500,000 to Angola. Um, but the, the biggest one on the list, I think the most important was over 200 million to Kenya, which in the past I, I talked about on the show and covered how Kenya actually hired lobbyists to lobby the Biden administration for vaccines. And so maybe that's why, uh, that country has gained so many, not because it's in need, but because, uh, they've, uh, effectively hired former, uh, Clinton officials to be their lobbyist in DC and, and to tell everybody that they really need the vaccines. The U S is also sending a uh, hundred thousand vaccines to the Maldives through the COVADS program, sending 1.7 million Pfizer vaccines through COVADS to Bangladesh, 3.4 million vaccines to uh, Pfizer vaccines to uh, the Philippines through COVATS. And again, the last couple of countries, I think, are uh, gaining a lot of vaccines because the U.S. is trying to use uh, COVID vaccine distribution as an anti-China propaganda tool in Southeast Asia. And Lebanon got over 600,000 uh, doses of uh I'm not sure it didn't say in this one, actually, uh, but they got 600,000 doses through the COVADS program. So that's where they're sending money are sending, <laughs> sending the vaccines. Now, USAID, which in the past I explained, is working with the State Department and National Security Council on the three person panel uh, to distribute the COVID vaccines in just a couple months here into the fiscal year. Right. Because that starts, I think, uh, end of September, beginning of October for the United States. Uh, USAID is running short on money for this. Of course, we have a trillion dollar Pentagon budget. But 
but we can have a little bit of money to donate vaccines around the world. Uh, it's just absurd that this is any kind of issue. Now, the, the other possibility is, I don't want to discount that, that maybe this is a propaganda effort by Sam Power, who heads up AID, uh, to get more money by saying, you know, they're out of money, we're distributing all these COVID vaccines, poor us. Uh, maybe they could get a lot more funding for her uh, interest in Ethiopia or one of these other countries where I think she has her eye on regime change. Last thing I want to note is that Israel is planning to give a fourth uh, dose of the mRNA COVID vaccines. I'm not sure. I don't know if Israel ever gave a whole bunch of Johnson and Johnson shots. And so it could be for Israel. Essentially, everybody will be on their fourth shot. It's going to start with for, uh, people age 60 and over first. And Israel is working on a, um, I think, a testing program first for this um you know they're, they're gonna run a, a trial before they i guess just open it up to everybody over 60 uh but interesting that it does seem like a fourth dose of the mrna vaccines is coming to anybody on the uh you know vaccine path <laughs> 